I don't see the inventory thing working itself out anytime soon. And if people do call you, it's a fraction of the people that would have called you if you would have. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Ricky Caru. He is an investor, a speaker, and soon to be remembered, in my opinion, as a legend in the industry. And that has nothing to do with what a company can do for you. What's that process? What's your team look like? What's your process look like? You know, and it's like, I'll be fine. You'll be fine. You know, how in the world just like, how does this just happen? How's 500,000 people say they're that ha unhappy? I don't get it. Yeah, that maybe they're locked in, but it's like pros and cons. You're gonna, there's not, no system's gonna be perfect. It's a much better system, right? Where buyers get representation, not out of their pocket. You know, there's a home buyer. I don't think that they conspired. It's like, wait a minute, isn't the whole case about a conspiracy between the defendants? Buy your first home. You don't know anything. You don't know anything if you're not in real estate on your, on your fifth home. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Ricky Caruth in the house. What's up, bro? How you doing? Good, man. How you doing? Good. It's funny. So, Ricky, I was thinking, if you remember this, maybe you do. We uh, we met a while ago. Um, you did the 4D dive. Yeah. And uh, you're just kind of getting some momentum on your Instagram. And I remember we somehow found each other on Instagram. And I and I uh, talked to you, and you're like, yeah, dude, my, uh, my goal is to be, like, one of the best real estate coaches in the game. And a lot of people are probably like, I don't think that's going to happen, dude. He's not going to take out Tom Ferry and all these guys. Well, now we're in 2023, guys, almost 24. Uh, I think all you guys, the haters, you're wrong because uh, Ricky's up there, man. Yeah, it's been um, it's been interesting. Journey. Yeah, it's been interesting. Um, as you try to do something like that, watching all the people that um, just think you're full of shit. Um, you know, but like that, that's been the story of my life. Um, when I was, uh, a freshman, I was like, I'm going to play football and everybody laughed at me for that. It was fucking all County my senior year. I had a full paid scholar, had a full, full paid scholarship. Um, I got in real estate and everybody laughed. Yeah. I was 20. Um, everybody thought I was too young and stuff or whatever. You know, or definitely didn't come from like the genetic makeup to make a, you know, make a good like political figure slash, you know, real estate agent salesperson. Um, it's been the story of my life, man. Like doing things that I'm not supposed to do or whatever, you know? So, I mean, when I started coaching and everybody talked shit, dude, so many people here locally talked so much smack about what I was doing. Um, I had a dude follow me around like Gary V and doing the little docu series of, you know, my daily life and stuff. Um, people thought that was, you know, garbage. People were like, who the hell does he think he is? Not to me, not to my face. Some of the people did some stuff to my face, but, um, it's nothing new, bro. That's like, that's been, that's been my whole life is, uh, people doubting me and stuff. So yeah. I love it. Well, congrats. Um, it's been fun to watch. So I want to have you on today because obviously there's a lot of stuff going on as you know. Um, I think kind of like just before we get into it real quick, like what have you been up to these days? I know, I know you're not really selling. I know you're coaching and stuff, but What's what's really got your attention these days you're excited about? Just trying to create better content, honestly. Um, you know, content is what really drives, like, the size of your brand, you know? Like, like a lot of people will post a lot and don't really get a lot of traction, which that was kind of me for a while. And um, they're like, you know, like, they'll hire a company thinking that that's going to be the thing. Or, like, I, I'll see emails from these social media from like youtube se they're like let's really crank your youtube up or whatever and stuff and i'm just thinking about all the people that they actually take advantage of that want to go big on youtube or instagram or whatever 
And this company's out there saying, we can make that happen for you. We can make you big. We can whatever. And like no company can do that for you at all, right? The whole thing comes down to perfecting your craft around creating content that people actually want to watch. That's all it is. If people will watch your content... You know, like the watch time on your content, on your reels and your YouTubes and everything else. That's what drives the algorithm, dude. That's like the one algorithmic driver is watch time, I think. Um, 100%. That's what all the, that's what YouTube and all them like, right? They love when you have more watch time. If you can get people to watch longer of your videos because it's actually good content and that has nothing to do with what a company can do for you right it's it's about you you know and the way you articulate your message in a way that captivates people to keep them engaged throughout the video and um it's just a skill that you have to develop over time so what i'm been focused on is just developing that skill i'm trying to create content that people want to watch i'm trying to learn that entire game to where you know I just grow organically. Um, I don't. I don't really run ads or anything. It's just all organic, and um, I'm just trying to learn that. What's that process way. look like? What's that process? What's your team look like? What's your process look like? Um, it's just me. I've got some editors that do the reels. They're in India, and uh, you know, I've been with them for a long time, and you know, they make stuff that's and they make stuff that's great. You know. <laughs> uh, I don't post everything that they make and, you know, um, YouTube, I've got, I've got a guy in the Philippines that edits maybe 30% of the videos. Like if you see a YouTube with words running across it, I didn't do that. If you see like a breaking news video of just me talking head with a couple cuts back and forth between a screen share an article i i i filmed and edited that more than likely that day um, i remember by the way to jump in i remember when i first met you you're filming editing doing it all posting yeah. you're applying to everybody like the, just so you guys know like ricky was like the real deal doing it all dude and selling 100 homes so if you're like i don't have time for this shit, you just don't you're it's bull get up earlier stay up late you're doing it all um every yeah. dm Every text, like I just typed out an email, literally, uh, like, it's funny that we're talking about this, this email that I literally just sent out, it says, believe it or not, I still sit down myself and not only think about what I'm going to make my weekly email about, but also to create it just as I do every one of these emails you're reading right now, along with every text, DM post, etc. I do all this myself. Why? Because what people read within your content is how they associate you. And I want everyone to know the true, authentic, raw Ricky. This is how you need to think when you are creating. Uh, I literally, like 15 minutes before we just hopped on, wrote that out and sent it out to, you know, a couple hundred thousand agents. Um, yeah, yeah. Because you're on Neil, you're on Neil's mastermind yesterday. And uh, I knew you had the email game, and I know that works. I know it works for like Ryan Serhan and a lot of other people. And the agents just don't do it. And I loved how you called somebody out because I write, I do three emails, a blog, like a brief and stuff, and it's mine. And I realized when I started doing mine, people can tell. And you said if you're just sending out this generic crap that gets sent out, like what are you doing? Like you know, like it. People can tell. Yeah. Well, people that it's called late being lazy. Um, in my opinion, you know, if you hire a company to just do generic content for you on your socials or emails or whatever, and it's just so generic, it's just nobody's reading it. Nobody's calling you. And if people do call you, it's a fraction of the people that would have called you if you would have spent the time. People spell value T-I-M-E. And they can tell if you've spent time and when they can tell you spent time, they feel like it's valuable and they appreciate it. Um, and then you've got the people that actually spend the time to create generic content too, which I find very fascinating that they actually spent the time 
to actually cultivate and create this content that's very generic and they could have spent the same time actually creating something original and giving some context to their opinions on stuff and they wasted that time to create something that looks just as generic as some of the what some of the companies will make for you we just got to get away from that if you really want to stand out yeah i agree um what's your uh what's your two cents on the market uh, I know you kind of said I mentioned it yesterday. Um, what's your kind of outlook for, you know, now in 2024? Well, it depends on rates. Um, you know, kind of what happens. The lower we go, the more activity we're going to have, and the higher it goes, the less activity we're going to have. Um, you can't help but think that rates are going to come down next year, but you never know. You just never know. Um, we had a good inflation report, I think, this week. So that was encouraging. Um, but, you know, there's still some tailwinds happening in the economy. You know, um, credit card debt just hit a trillion. Um, you know, people are running out of money. They ran out of stimulus. They Now they're running out of credit cards. Credit card interest rates are like 20%. You know, there's some problems. Um, you know, and it's like, I'll be fine. You'll be fine. You know, people that are, you know, at the top of the food chain will be fine. But if all the people at the bottom of the food chain aren't fine, then the whole thing collapses. So, um, so there's some worry about, you know, the short term of it, but as far as home prices go, we're going to be just fine. You know, there's not going to be any forced selling. What four out of five homes are under five percent interest rate or something like that? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, forty five percent of homes are owned free and clear in the U.S. Insane. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's going to be no forced selling. Um, rents seem to be cooling off, coming down a tad. Um, you know, it's all local, so different markets are performing differently, but that kind of plays into it. But if you don't see a crash in rents, then that's going to be fine. Um, it can afford to come down a tad, 10, 15%. Because the whole thing is, is if somebody's sitting on three and a half, four and a half percent interest rates on their house and they have to move, they can just rent their house out. If rents don't crash, you know, then that market continues to keep inventory low. And, um, you know, the investors, you know, want to buy. It's just, I don't see the inventory thing working itself out anytime soon. Um, you know, hard to, yeah, long tail of that. Now, when rates do come down a, a bit, which the uh, NAR says will be between six and seven at some point next year, which will be, I think that'll create like a freaking tsunami of activity. I think we'll see active listings go from bad to worse. And we'll see number of transactions skyrocket because we're going to have the trade up sellers sell and buy, you know, taking, you know, creating two transactions, but a net even for active listings. And then first time home buyers come in and flood the market, which they've, it went from 26% first time home buyers last year to 32% this year. It's well below the average of 36% since 1981. But it's increasing. It's going to continue to increase. And if we get some relief on mortgage rates, those first time home buyers are just going to flood the market and really crush what inventory we have left. So it's going to be interesting. I think we're going to see like a, a mini 2021 where we have like a lot of transactions and, and really good, you know, strong market. Um, I don't know if we'll see the price increase that we saw in 2021 though, right? So I think we'll see less of an increase, still an increase, a uh, lot of a lot of transactions. It's just going to be. I think 2024 is going to be a really, really, really great rebound year for for housing in terms of transactions for sure. But like I say, it all depends on rates. You know, I'm here for it, whatever happens. I I, I was t talking on the Zoom yesterday um, about like. Every once in a while, I get the itch to hop back in the game and, <laughs> and make some calls and get some listings and stuff. But at the end of the day, I like what I'm doing, traveling, speaking, you know, getting better content, 
trying to build community, you know, so. Yeah, you're doing a good job. What, uh, I mean, in the, in the mortgage world over here, I think, I don't know the peak, I think, um, housing work wire put out an article, the peak might've been 400,000 LOs in 21. They're saying maybe by re-enter 2025, there'll be 60 to 80,000 left. Say that again. So I think the peak of about loan officers when the refi boom was here, you know, everybody was yeah. employed to the neck. There's around 400,000 loan officers. Their housing wire came out with an article saying by the end of 2024, because the higher rate, there might be 60, 80,000 loan officers left. So 400 down to 60. Yeah. So that's kind of that. I mean, that that's kind of like saying that because of the lawsuits with, uh, commissions that the agents are going to go from 2 million to 500,000. It's like, that's a very, you know, far cry. I think I just, I don't see it going from 400 to 60,000, right? That's a very clicky clickbaity article. If you ask, and I love housing wire. Uh, they're actually one of my favorites. Uh, Logan's. Yeah. Friend. I love Logan. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I like. We already it. lost about fifty percent, though, or more. So it's went down from four hundred to two hundred so far. I think even maybe less. Or eight hundred yeah. to four hundred. No, I think it went like it might be down fifty, sixty. Yeah, we'll know soon who renews their license here coming up. So well, it it's to be pretty bad. It now it's maybe two. could be a hundred. Could be a hundred, a little bit. Well, it's so, gonna happen, right? A mortgage is a different world. That that I was think I I, I realized this a long time ago that in the mortgage world, it's so different than the real estate agent world. You know, with agents, deals happen every day, no matter what, right? You got cash deals, you got, um, you know, you got buyers and sellers you're working with. On the, on the mortgage side, you know, like everybody could say, I'm not going to get a loan, you know, and I'm going to use the builder's, you know, lender because they're doing this and I'm going to pay cash or, Lend the the mortgage market is far more fragile than being a real estate agent. Yeah, because you could be a high end real estate agent in New York, and everybody just pays cash, right? You don't even need a loan officer. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of those guys have um, huge lines of credit, and you know, the the big wealthier luxury home buyers and stuff. But yeah, no, be it the mortgage industry as a whole, especially for loan officers, is just a much more fragile, volatile market, in my opinion, than, you know, real estate. Real estate agents is like, you can't really bring them down. Once you understand the flow of the cycles of the the, the market, it's hard to really take you out. More mortgage lenders, on the other hand, um, they're a little, little more easier to take out. You know, the mar the market's a little bit more, they're a little bit more fragile when it comes to the market. But Yeah, because some shops are refi shops, right? There's there's only, eight, that's down 85%. You could be out of business, right? If you don't yeah. purchase, so you're right. Yeah, so it's a different, exactly. there's so we, we know the difference. See, that, that, that makes my point, right? So there, there's a market there that's down 85%. You know, there's not really a market in, in for real estate agents that's down 85%. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a any rush. So I've been actually, uh, you mentioned consuming your content. I started watching your YouTube videos because I was like, oh, well, I know Ricky. I trust Ricky's, you know, you know what's going on. And I started watching your commission lawsuit stuff because I was like, I mean, there's so much bull about it too, right? Like all this. I was kind of laughing too. I loved your, uh, Reels when you're doing the guy with the glasses. Honestly, I was kind of that was pretty funny. That was like, I was like losing my at the first time. I was like, "What's Ricky doing?" Then when he came in, I was like, "I I lost I lost." That was pretty good. That was like stand up comedy. Like that was oh, yeah, good, dude. That was yeah. that was pretty bomb. That was like one of your best for sure. Like I was like, if that guy watches it, it's like he's got to kind of laugh. But so there's all this talk about the commission loss, dude. You know. Yeah. Now you have, because it's so much out there, I have clients call on me, go, do you know about it? And I said, honestly, like, I, I, what do you want me to tell you? This is, I feel like it's just a bunch of drama. Um, and I said, nobody knows how, oh, it's not even over, right? So what, what is, what's your take on it? Um, I know you have lots of opinions, but what do you really think is going on? And 
how in the world is just like, how does this just happen? How's 500,000 people say they're that ha unhappy? I don't get it. It's just a money grab. Um, it's just, yeah. a, it's just your classic class action. Let's see if we can make some money here kind of thing. It's like when you hear about anything, a lot of people, they'll hear something, you know, about a class action they can get in on and they can make all this money or whatever. Um, the lawyer is very good at what he does. Uh, Michael Ketchmark, the lawyer, the plaintiffs, he, his job is to make money is to, is to, his job is to take situations and yeah, I mean, a, a, a good word for it is manipulate them into, um, a storyline that benefits the plaintiffs and his law firm. And what a hell of a job. I mean, that guy really did his job and he smoked the defendant's lawyers. I mean, that's really what happened at the end of the day. Um, and the plaintiff, the, the jury is just a bunch of, you know, uh, gruntled, you know, home sellers too. Right? Yeah. And so people don't really under, they just think, oh my God, 6%. Oh, it's 2% in the UK. You know, this is crazy. But they don't realize in the UK there's so many lawsuits of buyers who get screwed over because they aren't disclosed that the foundation's messed up or, you know, they got taken advantage of on price, right? Because they can't afford their own representation. It's kind of like here in the US, we have 30 year fix, but they don't have it in a lot of countries. Well, those other countries, and like, and some of the YouTube gurus are like, that's the problem with the US. We have the 30 year fix, and that's why inventory's low. That's why prices are going up. But it's like over there in these other countries where there aren't 30 year fixed, they're like an arm, adjustable rates and stuff. Well, those people's mortgage payments are like doubling, right? Over oh, yeah. Night, they're getting kicked out of their homes. And guess what? Prices are still extreme, are way are higher than the US. Okay. They're higher right. than the US. Our neighbor Canada. Our neighbor Canada has mainly yeah. adjustable rates. Yeah. They're they're higher than the US. So so that isn't the pro so 30 year fixed isn't the problem why prices are high. Number one, if you want to blame it, just look at the countries that don't have it. It's not the problem. Um, and I would rather a system where we don't have people getting kicked out of their homes, right? I mean, yeah, that maybe they're locked in, but it's like pros and cons. You're gonna there's not no system's gonna be perfect. You know, would you rather them have a house or have a double the the mortgage payment overnight in five years? Same thing with this, you know, okay, we can go to an overseas type business model when it comes to real estate agents, but look, but think about the pros and cons of what we have. It's a much better system, right? Where buyers get representation, not out of their pocket. You know, there's a home buyer uh, suit now where the home buyers are now saying that, you know, that they're, that they, you know, they're mad that they didn't get to negotiate their commission or um, whatever. And it's like, wait a minute, buyers, like you want it to be where you have to come out of your pocket for this, right? You want to come out of your pocket for it instead of it being figured in, you know? Um, you know, I, I don't know where they're going with that. Right. And we'll just have to wait and see. There's like nine or 10 lawsuits right now, especially since the Sitzer Burnett got the verdict came out, a bunch more popped up, different states and stuff. And the judge hasn't even ruled on this Sitzer Burnett, which that'll tell us a lot right there about how this is going to go. But agents have kind of become public enemy number one. But in, in the meanwhile, okay, while everybody talks smack about agents, 90% of buyers and sellers use an agent by choice. Yeah, I don't. It's like they don't. They don't have to use an agent. They can just go straight to the listing agent now and and bypass all of this. Neg they can negotiate the commission. I've had buyers. I've had buyers negotiate their commission with me. I've had se every seller just about has negotiated their commission with me. You know, and when I did deals, we're, we're just kind of sitting here waiting to see what the judge is going to say about this. He see if he's going to give an injunction or if he's going to create some rule that we have to go by until this is appealed out of court and up to the Supreme justice and stuff like that. So it's interesting, man, for there's a, there's a couple of different ways I look at it for one. Well, first off, what do I think is going to happen? I think it's going to get appealed up to the Supreme court. 
and then we'll see what happens. It doesn't sound like the higher ups, like the DOJ, and you know, it doesn't sound like the Department of Justice, and we you know wherever we go to in the Supreme Court or whatever is going to be on our side. It doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> I'm not getting the feeling that we're going to get a lot of love when it comes to comes to this, and it's unfortunate because. I don't I just really don't think that they understand what's going on here. It's a lawyer that's gonna make a billion dollars while the homeowners get a couple thousand apiece. What's so funny yeah. is, is the same thing that he's suing us for, us, I say us as in the National Association of Realtors and all the brokerages and now even EXP is in on this next lawsuit he filed. So what's so funny is is like it's so ironic because the thing that he's suing us for, he's literally doing the same thing that he's suing us for while he's suing us. It's insane. It's it's. It, I'm telling you, this is how, that's how good this lawyer is. He's literally doing the same thing right in front of our face that he's accusing us of doing while he's accusing us of doing it. It's insane. So the homeowners who are disgruntled because, you know, they had to pay the buyer agent uh, fee this this buyer agent that brought the buyer that paid it's like they were happy with what they netted right it's like it's like you were happy with your net with your bottom line net when you did this and now you're not if you aren't happy with the net negotiate up some more to get the net that you want who cares what happens on top of that and if we can't make it work we can't make it work I mean this is what you want Mr. Seller um and so and and look, in those deals, the sellers made way more than the agents, right? When they when they sold those properties or whatever the case may be. In the case, it, so if they're disgruntled in that situation, how are they not disgruntled when this lawyer walks away with a billion dollars and they get two thousand or fifteen hundred bucks? How are they walking away from the table saying, "Yes, you know, but that's the exact same thing that you're mad at us for." You're giving this lawyer the same thing, and he didn't negotiate his fee, I can guarantee you. And that's what's so crazy is that the lawyers, they actually have the, the in my opinion, the whole lawyer thing is the racket. It's got the all the antitrust stuff in there, right? And the crazy thing is, is they can't sue each other because it's part of their, uh, you know, pact when they become a lawyer that they can't sue each other. So, like, they're sitting on the biggest monopoly, running the entire show from the legal side, from the courts, right? And you, they don't negotiate. They're getting the biggest part of the pie, and you can't sue them. It's, 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 it's so crazy how this thing is kind of playing out. But, the, but, the, but, the, but the, from the public's point of view, you know, they just view us as monsters. Like, y'all don't do nothing. You just open doors. We can find the properties on our own on Zillow. What do we need you for? Um, why am I? Why are you getting two or three percent? You know, and it's like, wait a minute. What about all this other stuff that I do? And by the way, you don't have to. You, you go 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 represent yourself now. So ninety percent of buyers and sellers right now use real estate agents, and ninety percent of those who use agents say that they would recommend their agent to somebody else. So while the whole general public's talking smack about agents, people, you know, when they need to buy or sell something, 90% of them, we're the first person they call to help them through the transaction. They're happy as can be through the transaction enough to say, I'll recommend this agent to other friends and family who may buy or sell. And then years later, of course, even, even the plaintiff, when he went on stand, he said that he was happy with his agent. He was happy with the deal. He was happy with everything. And then um, and then the lawyer, Michael Kutchmark, even said, hey, do you think REMAX conspired with the other defendants to, to, in, to, to take money out of your pocket? And he said, no, I don't think that they conspired. It's like, wait a minute, isn't the whole case about a conspiracy between the defendants, you know, to, to conspire to inflate commissions? And the lawyer of the plaintiffs just asked the plaintiff if he thought they conspired, and he said no. Then you got the lady whose mom was an agent who was on the stand, who's part of the lawsuit, one of the plaintiffs. You know, she's like, I bought, you know, I've sold uh, four houses and bought five. 
You know, it's like, well, you didn't pay a commission when you bought the houses. You paid it when you sold it. So you're up one. You bought five, you sold four. She's like, well, if I can do something to, to help my kids, they're coming into their the years of where they're going to buy and sell homes. If I can help them, I'll help them. It's like, what you're doing is putting them in a situation where now they're going to have to pay out of their pocket. If we had, if we had it your way, they would have to pay out of their pocket for representation when they buy their first home. Yeah. When you buy your first home, you don't know anything. You don't know anything if you're not in real estate on your on your fifth home, right? You may know exactly. a little bit. You may you may understand the process, but every deal is different. It has twists and turns and stuff, and that's that's what you need an agent for to make sure you're, you know, moving through those twists and turns best as possible. But uh, it's crazy. Kids, I'm gonna help them. It's like you're not helping them; you're hurting them. They're gonna have to come out of pocket, and if they can't afford a representation, then um, then they're gonna have to represent themselves because of what you're doing. And if they get screwed on the deal because they don't know what they're doing and they can't afford representation, then that's your fault, ma'am. So it just keeps on going. I think it could go to the Supreme Court and get thrown out. It's gonna take years for the appeal. If if it goes to Supreme Court and gets thrown out and and NAR wins, then they could literally block all the future lawsuits, and this thing could be just over and and put to bed. Uh, wow. I th I think what could happen is is that we now will go out and have to disclose more clearly to the sellers and buyers that you know the seller can pay the buyer agent fee or he doesn't have to. Everything's negotiable. Right, he can offer zero on MLS now, so I think all that's going to come to light where agents have to disclose that and explain it to every single client with a hundred percent clarity with a signature, and um, and then we'll truly sit back and let the market dictate how how the how the industry will operate from that point. And I and I and I'm to the belief at this point that nothing's going to change. Yeah, I mean, especially if you take up, you know, you know this, the first time home buyer, they put, they usually have their down payment, a little bit reserves. They don't have extra money to pay a commission. Listen, man, if builders did not have to pay a buyer agent commission, trust me, they would not be doing it. Okay. If builders could get away from paying the buyer, if they could get away from anything they can get away from cost wise, they're going to do it. Okay. That, that builders are a great example of what the market is. That's a good point. Right? If builders could get out of the buyer agent commission, they would. Why do they do it? Why do they offer it? Because there's a lot of value in having this massive group of local agents, you know, trying to help you sell your product. You know, now from seller to seller, you'll definitely have sellers who don't understand the value. And they're going to put zero in that column. Well, you know what they're going to find out? It's going to be real tough to sell when you don't have any. You know what that's called when you put zero for the buyer agent commission? A mill or something? <laughs> it's, called, it, it's, it's called a pocket listing. It's called a for sale by owners. Yeah. Right? For sale by owners are like, bring me a buyer for 3%. I'll give you 3% if you bring me a buyer. Right? Or a pocket listing. It's like, I don't want to list it, but if you find a buyer, I'll pay you 3% or whatever. Right? You're yeah. literally a pocket listing. You're for that agent that has it listed. Right. Or you're for sale by owner on MLS. That's all you are at that point. You're nothing else. You've hired an agent to find the buyer. That's it. You didn't hire all the agents in the area to find the buyer. You just hired that one agent. And so now you've got one agent instead of having this massive sea of agents trying to help you sell that property. And, you know, the market's going to speak like you're going to see properties that don't have a buyer agent commission sell a lot slower well that's now you're saying now you're admitting ricky that that agents steer no I'm, it's not steering right so i'm not I'm not saying that agents steer i'm saying that why are they going to go they're they're not going to show a property that's not offering compensation for them to find the buyer of that's not steering right it's not now, motivating yeah if the my if the buyer you know finds it on their own online Go for it. Call the listing agent and buy the property. You know? But you're not going to get the best representation, right? 
It's yeah, kind of I'm funny. I thought it's saying I'm going to if, if they're not paying me anything, why am I going to try to sell this house? And I thought, too, in the real estate world, I mean, not I don't care either way, but I thought. I hear people frown upon dual agents when you're a dual agent. They're like, oh, you should have representation on both sides. It's almost like you're pushing to have dual agent. You're like they're, you know, they're pushing. Like, yeah, they're pushing to do away with. You know, having buyers, agents and stuff and. uh you know, they want to move towards a more of a dual agent. It's the craziest thing ever, man. Like everything that they're wanting us to go to contradicts everything they've told us that they didn't want, you know, exactly. over the years. So I'm telling you, it's a money grab and the lawyer has everyone fooled. Like the judge is fooled. I mean, this is my opinion. You know, the DOJ is full, the, um, the, 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 the general public, buyers and sellers, you know, and, and listen, if you're listening to this and you're a buyer or seller, you're saying, oh my God, this guy's just go sell your house on your own. Go buy a house on your own. Like I'm not telling you to use an agent. I'm telling you not to use an agent. If that's what you want, why are you, why are you using agents now? You know, I mean, it, 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 it it's like I'm going to have a roof or roof in my house and I'm going to complain about the price. OK, same thing. You you hire an agent to sell your house. You complain about the price. Well, I can't change the price. See, and, and a lot of this complaining, I think, too, comes from W-2 employees. Who don't understand oh, get, when I get a thirty thousand dollar check, I don't get thirty thousand dollars. You know, when they get a check, they get to spend all the money in that check because taxes are taken out before they get the money. I run a business. It's an independent contractor. I get a 1099. So now I have to pay taxes and business expenses that you don't have to pay. And you don't know what those expenses are. Right? It's ridiculous to uh, cost to be a real estate agent and to run your own business. It's ridiculous. You know, oh, They don't want sure. to take that into consideration. They just want to say, you made 30000 No, I didn't. Not after Uncle Sam gets his and my broker gets theirs and my assistant gets hers and all the other business expenses that go into marketing and everything that, that happens yeah. within my world to keep my business going. That's why you don't see agents going too far below 3% because anything below that, gets you get to where you're you're losing money. Yeah, I've, have you heard that like, the three dollar thing where they put three dollars on the table. Have you heard that? Um, some when some guy went to sell a property, I forgot where this guy goes. And like you know, can we negotiate? He said sure. He, he pulls out three dollars. He puts one dollar bill to you know, three dollars in a row. Yeah. And he goes, okay, cool. What do you want? He goes, well, two percent. So he takes a dollar and puts it over here. They go, what's that? He goes, well, there's your marketing budget. Well, what's the two left? Well, that's for my team and that's for me. Now, you want to pay one percent? Cool. You just took away my team. So basically you have left is just me. I can't market and my team can't help you work on this. You sure you want to go to two or one? It's kind of a smart thing, but that's what people don't get. That is the reality of a real estate agent. You have and, and, that, you have and, and, and that's why when, when the lawyer was up there talking about that, you know, agents don't negotiate down and all this stuff. They can't. I'm, I'm sorry, general public, right? I'm sorry. It's, that's a fact. Right. It's it's like it's like when you roof someone's house, they've got the labor that they have to pay for, the materials they have to pay for, and then their profit. Okay. You guys act like our commission is all straight profit. And like we can just wiggle that around and still we'll be okay even if we take one percent. It's like no. No, we won't, because we can't even buy the materials and the labor for the crew to, to roof the house. Yeah. For that, much less make a profit out of it. So that's when you that's when you start to become unprofitable. When you start to you know the further you get away from three percent, the less profitable you are. And and when you get down into the, you know, I don't know at what what percentage you you actually break even and start losing money, but it's up in the twos. Okay, so I just don't think people really understand the whole process and everything from the inside out. And, 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 and here's the thing, the market is going to tell them, right. The market's going to prove to them because for you, 
when agents don't do a deal because it's, you know, sellers want to do 1% or 2% and agents just walk away from those deals, you're, the owners and the buyers are going to find out real quick how valuable an agent is and be happy to pay 3%. I mean, that's just what it is. Yeah, because what you're sh what you're showing to the general public is number one is you're already unrealistic, right? With the, what you're doing, you're also showing to the general public that I don't even know what I'm doing because that's not that's not what you. If you're serious about selling your house, that's not the approach you take. And the second thing is, people are kind of like you're probably a pain in the ass to deal with because the way you're dealing with this, and it's like why don't I just go and show my clients all the other houses and go look, we can take an offer, but. This guy's unreasonable already. Let's just move on to the 10 other houses. They seem like they're ready to sell. They're serious. I mean, I don't know. That's how I'd look at it. Yeah, it, ju it just depends. What's, um, I wanted to jump into, I know you're uh, investing in real estate. A lot of the podcast people on here are uh, real estate investors. Um, what's your, are you raising money? Are you buying your own stuff? I know I've heard different things you talk about. So I don't know exactly what you're up to these days. With investing, you yeah, know, um, you know, we got into trying to syndicate some apartments about the time interest rates started coming up. So we haven't done anything there. We've just been kind of learning the business. Um, I'm closing on three acres to build 46 units uh, at the end of the year. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, nice. I'll put together investment group to uh, to tackle that one. I bought a bunch of new construction homes, DR Horton homes here lately. And, you know, I bought a couple of existing homes and stuff. I, um, I moved all, I bought an office space, a smaller one and moved into it and rented out the one that I was in. That's big that nobody uses. Um, so just making some moves, man, rearranging some stuff, trying to increase the, uh, the monthly cash flow of everything and just kind of keep building, you know, um, I'm just having. You like the multifamily? What's up? You like the multifamily stuff? Yeah, I do. Um, I've got a bunch of duplexes and fourplexes and single family and commercial, small commercial buildings and stuff. And uh, just do fantastic with it, especially with the way rent has gone and, you know, and, and appreciation and everything. It's like, you know, um, but this project of 46 apartments. It'll be my first, that'll be my biggest, you know, deal so far. And it's kind of, it's a, it's like my biggest deal, but it's a small deal in the whole scheme of things. 46 units is a small deal, um, but I'm going to develop it. I'm going to build them. It's like two, three miles from my house. It's really close. Wow. It's close to the beach. Yeah. They're building a new school here. It's, uh, it's just a really good, you know, setup. So yeah. Um, how do you find your deals? How does Ricky find deals? I mean, and that's kind of a general statement, but you know, I work, I know a lot of investors here. We invest, like what's your method of finding deals? Really Are you looking for deals? Like, yeah. I don't really like beat the bushes. I'll just kind of like, I'm just busy creating content and then like something will just come across my desk. Right. Um, I've got, I've got two guys. We flip houses. And we buy them at the courthouse step. So we watch the courthouse step foreclosure auctions coming up every week and kind of see if we want to buy something or, or uh, bid on something. We'll buy it. Like the last existing home I bought I was a two-bedroom, uh, you know, kind of older home. Um, kind of older home. And um, it uh, it's two-bedroom, big backyard, fence backyard. And we bought it to flip it. And when it came time to flip it, I was like, and my, I have two duplexes right around the corner. And I was like, I'm going to buy you guys out of this. And then one of my other partners of the three, he was like, I'm going to go in with you. So we bought the other guy out and just kept it and rented it. Um, we bought him out for 195 and rented it out immediately for $1,600. Um, you know, we own it. We, we just paid cash. So it's just 1600 a month coming in. Um, but that was like a flip we were going to do that fit my portfolio. So we just bought the other guy out. It just depends, man. Like the three acres that I'm going to build the 46 units on one of my buddies listed it. I've known him for, you know, you know, shit. I've known him for like 15 years and, uh, 
and he listed it and he knew I was looking for something to build some apartments on and he told me about it and then we just kind of started working on it. So it's just stuff that kind of comes to me. I don't really have any like clear cut plan. You know, this is how I go out and find deals and stuff like that. You know, the DR Horton homes we bought, um, let's see, who was it? I think one of the guys I flipped with, he was buying one. He told me about it. I started to run the numbers and I was like, damn. So I bought five of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the payments are like seventeen hundred, and we're renting them out for anywhere from twenty two to twenty four hundred a month. And those rents will, you know, rents are leveling out now, but they'll get back to a nice little two to three percent increase a year. Nothing crazy, just a nice little two to three percent increase a year, in my opinion. Over Plus, there. brand new properties too, right? Yeah, they're brand new, no maintenance for five years. You know, the builder paid five thousand in closing costs paid for our buy down permanent buy down we got 5.9 on investment property yeah. permanent buy downs um so you know i was like man you know let's let's buy you know let's buy a whole fleet of these things and while we're kind of just sitting here bored there was really nothing else that cash flowed like that in the market so i just kind of jumped on a handful of them and you know we got them all rented out and you know we're just kind of letting them do their thing so I'm kind of very like patient, methodical. I'm not pushing anything. I'm not like, you know, let's hurry up. I, I've got so much equity built up in properties that I just own free and clear. No, no mortgages on. I could like leverage that and go buy all kinds of stuff, you know, but I'm like, why? You know, it's not, my life is not going to change at all by, you know, doubling my portfolio in the next six months. You know, what, what yeah. I want to do is like add a property a month for like five years and then have like a hundred properties and then take another 20 years to pay it all off. It'll be a hundred million bucks worth of stuff, right? Cause if all that's average, if all that average is 500 a piece and it's a hundred properties, that's 50 mil, right? And within another 20 years, that should pretty conservatively double in price in 20 years, right? That's probably super conservative for a 20 year run. So... If those properties go from 500 to a mil, I own 100 of them, free and clear. I've got 100 mil worth of properties, probably making several, several hundred thousand a month, you know? Sure. And just chilling, sitting on a gold mine. So, like, that's an easy way for me to, like, see a path to 100 mil plus net worth and an incredibly, you know, large passive income for, for me. That's incredibly large. You know, and that's like outside of whatever businesses I'm creating and stuff, you know, that's just like something on the side in the background. Like I can get to a hundred mil by the time I'm 65 or whatever. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about in terms of investing is like, I'm not in a hurry. I'm not trying to sub two deals. I'm just trying <laughs> to own properties. I want to get them paid off. I want to own them. I want to take care of them and I want to build a massive portfolio and it, I don't care if it takes me 20 years to do it, you know? Yeah, that's smart. Do you think, um, I mean, do you think having your brand and everything you do just as a not, you know, take the agent hat off, the coach off, if you're, you know, just as a pure real estate investor, that helps you get deals, people bring you deals, you know, would you, you know, do you think that really helps with that kind of, uh, in that sector? What I, do. I don't really get a lot of deals because I only buy locally. Okay. I don't buy anything in other areas just because I don't have to. There's just really, here in Alabama. There's a really it's just a really good market. I'm I'm right on the beach. It's really low, like prices. Like the median price here is under well under four hundred. Um, right, and then we got these. We I got these new constructions for like three forty. So like I bought them four bedroom under the median price of my area. That was another thing that I really yeah. liked about them, right? Is that I was buying them kind of under the median and um, they cash flow really well, you know? And so it's just like, I don't I don't have to go out of my market to get the cash flow that I want and buy as many as I want. Like they're still building those. So I could buy more, you know, cause they're, they're like still building like crazy in that subdivision. I mean, they've got a couple years worth of, uh, construction left. It's not like there's a shortage. I could go buy Jeez. more and rent them out and everything. So 
Um, plus I'm building this apartment complex to like two, three miles from my house. So I don't have to go out of area. So for people that it's nice, it's nice being in your backyard. Yeah. I tell you what, I tell you what having the personal brand is probably going to help out with maybe is putting together investment groups on some of these projects later. Yeah, I agree. You know, so we'll see how that goes. The investment group I'm putting together for this development are just guys I've known forever that, you know, I'm like, here's this thing. And they're like, yeah, we're in. So I've pretty much got the investment group kind of put together, um, to take this down and build this building, um, without really having to go to my following and say, Hey, who wants to throw in on this and let's raise some money and stuff like that. Will a day like that come where I have a deal where I want to go and do a big webinar and say, Hey, here's a deal you guys can get in on probably you know yeah so that's where it'll probably help me later on raise some money how's um how's your daughter change your life i got two yeah she just turned four monday uh yeah we just had her birthday and stuff she's a mess dude she is a mess so they're gone right the second but most of the time they're here at the house so she's always coming in here and checking on me and stuff and you know, so that's really cool. Yeah. Did it change how you invest, how you do your schedule? Like, are you more, you know, you want to be more around, more present, you know, just come kind of that yeah. type of mentality. Like, you know, because you're just, when you don't have kids, you're go, 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 go. Right. And now you're like, you think about it, right? Like, yeah. I don't know. At this point in my life, I was already kind of like on the downslide, knocking off at five, knocking off on the weekends. Um, and then if I would have had a if I would have had a kid when I was like in my like twenties and thirties when I was when I was like go go like working like fifteen hours a day and stuff, I probably I don't know. It's hard to say, man, because like you probably still work the fifteen hours a day because you're trying to provide the best life for them. And now that I'm at this point in my life before I had a kid, yeah, I'm kind of like nothing really changed because I was already in the mode of like slowing down and knocking off at five and stuff. Um, when COVID hit, I was working out of my office like every day until COVID hit. And when COVID hit, then that changed everything where I was just, I never went back to the office. I made this little home office and this is, this is my spot. I'm never going to go work in an office. I, I say never, but I probably, I would imagine I'm never going to go work in an office again, like full time, like I did. So COVID changed a lot, a lot of things you know, I think for a lot of people and how they operate, where they operate, how they communicate and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, dude, it's, I love being a dad. It's fun, huh? Yeah. It's, it's cool to raise a uh, strong girls. It'll, it's good. We need more of them. They actually, what's cool is, is we, uh, I go speak like two or three times a month and they come with me everywhere. I see that. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really cool because we'll take a day and explore wherever we go. And uh, and then like eight out of ten of the talks I'll do, she'll walk up on stage with me, my daughter, you know, and kind of wave at everybody and stuff. So it, it's cool. That's awesome. What's um, what's any uh, what's your what's your biggest goals for probably this next coming year, twenty twenty four? Yeah. Um, just continue on really, but I'm, I'm, I'm redoing, um, the zero to diamond program. So I'm, I'm, I'm revamping that entire thing. So I'm excited about that. Um, I want to get that done. I want to get that done, um, this month where I'm just kind of redo the whole, like I'm making a whole new website and, uh, just the whole thing is going to be totally different. I'm using a different platform to kind of have the community on where all the course material will be there and stuff. And I'm excited about that um, and what the possibilities could be. And then outside of that, in December, I plan on trying to scratch out my entire calendar to write another book. Oh, boy. I'd like to get the get the third book done because it's been like six years since I wrote the first two. So I want to write this next one and just kind of bring it up to speed of, you know, 
from the other two were six years ago. So there's a lot wow. that's changed, right? Heck yeah. And so I want to, I want to, I want to redo the whole program and then write a book kind of around the new program, right? Where the book brings a ton of value and then funnels people straight to the new platform. That way we're just maximizing value to everybody. So I'd like to get that written in December so that we can work on getting it out, you know, hopefully, you know, Q2 or something like that where, you know, we can, you know, really get a big push there. So that, that'll be cool. So I'm excited about that. It's a lot of stuff. That's exciting. That'll be fun. Well, yeah, Ricky, I, yeah. See if I can get it done. Yeah. <laughs> It's hard. It's hard. It's, it's hard, a lot of work. It's hard with schedule and everything. You know. You know the Slight Edge. The is it the book? Yeah, the book, the Slight Edge. Yeah, yeah. Is it good? Jeff, Jeff Olson. So I went to Fort Lauderdale and interviewed him last week. Um, you know that guy is amazing, man. He in the nineties he had this TV show called The People's Network. I remember that. Well, he owned it, and it was Les Brown. Okay. Owned it. it was Les Brown. Yeah. Dear Hardy and Jim Rohn and Brian Tracy, like all the big guys mm. from the 90s, yeah. And um, and I didn't realize, like, how, how – I knew he was big, but, like, I didn't know that he was, like, best friends with all those guys, right? He wow. was – he's one of them. He just didn't get on social media and do his thing. Um. But anyway, I, I interviewed him last week. And uh, and the slight edge is doing the little things that add up to these massive achievements. But in the moment, that that task is so insignificant. You know, like if you make the calls you're supposed to make to build your real estate business today, your business doesn't really change that much today, right? And it doesn't really get hurt that much. So it's so insignificant today in the moment right but the moment's all you have and if you don't do this insignificant thing in the moment then you're not going to have this massive achievement later it's so crazy but he did a study with his salespeople, and he said that no matter how he sliced it up in anything somebody wanted to achieve when they were halfway to the goal they were they were 18 percent to the results so like if somebody wanted to make an extra say thousand dollars a month it took them um, a year to get there. Well, at six months, they were going to be at one hundred and eighty dollars a month, right? And then they went from one hundred and eighty to a thousand that second six months. And he was like, "I told him about my YouTube hitting a hundred thousand. He said, and I said it took about six seven years. He said, "Well, where were you year three? I said about twenty thousand. He said, "There you go, halfway through." Right, halfway through that it took you, you were about eighteen percent of the way there. You're about eighteen thousand subs halfway there, right? And so, like a lot of these things you do are so insignificant in the moment, don't change anything today. But like over time, it, it's this curve, and it just spikes the further you go go along. And it's like with writing a book or reading a book, it's like if you don't do it, it not really significant today you know but you've got to find time to do the little things that are going to add up to be massive you know so i gotta put i, I agree with that i always say like right now you were saying yesterday um this is really kind of when it hit the gas right um because when things change get better in the industry whether rates come down the momentum that slingshots forward is insane you just you and if you've never if you're in business, business long enough, you know how it is. You can't just really describe it. It's just like you did all this work. You feel like you, it's like nothing's happening. All of a sudden, the, the moment comes, you start getting busy, and all of a sudden, all that momentum just slingshots forward, and you get all this business. People go, how that happen? I'm like, it's, it's not what you did now. It's what you did all those little, like you said, those little things you did prior, right? People just don't, they just want that instant gratification. Well, they, they want the YouTube channel in the first week, 100,000. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, uh, it's there's hard. An age, there's an agent in my group, and he messaged me like he's gonna have to go get another, go get a job and stuff. And he's like, I've just been making calls. I've been crazy hustling. I'm doing the email. I'm doing videos and doing everything. I just can't get anything going. And I'm like, 
Well, number one, you're just calling geo leads, just like random property owners, not random, like you're targeting them, but you got to realize like four out of five people have a, a 5% or less rate and um, 45% of these homes, like they, they're just, chances are really slim. They're going to sell right now. The relationships you're building will explode later when the market rebounds, right? I said, but you got to get into expireds, man, and quit doing the same leads every day and not get any results, like switch it up. A lot of people just don't switch it up. They just keep doing the same stuff. You got to have a few little different avenues. But I was like, man, and I started breaking down this whole situation. And I was like, bro, I'm looking at this like, whoa, this dude sit on a gold mine. Because when the market rebounds, his his business is going to explode. And he doesn't even know it. He's sitting here thinking he's failing, but he's sitting on a gold mine because these people are going to, because he's got a, he's got like 2,800 people to get in his email. It's got like a 35% open rate, right? So it's like, you know, two, 300 people, hey. whatever, opening his email or something like that, more than that. And um, he just needs to keep building that up, right? Get to 1,000 where you got 350 people opening it, get it to 2,000, you got 700 people opening it, and just kind of keep building that. But when the market rebounds and all those people that are paying attention to your email decides they want to buy or sell, who are they going to call? Right. Some of them may call other agents, but some of them are going to call him, yep. you know, and then they're going to do business with them and realize, wow, this guy gives great service. I'm going to recommend him to everybody. We love how he helped us here. It's just it's just the way it goes, man. You think you're failing until you're not. It's a good point. I mean, honestly, because a lot of people are struggling right now, but like that's what they don't get. It's, you know, they feel like they're running on a treadmill, but, you know. When the market when the market comes to that point where things start to change, all that should, you know, push forward and add up. But you just gotta be able to make it. That's why when the times are good, you gotta buy cash flowing stuff or save your money. You can't spend it all. <laughs> exactly. So, man. Exactly. Reggie, I appreciate the time as always. Good seeing you, brother. Congrats on everything. Um, I will say when I do talk to a lot of people, and I do recommend a lot of people to go follow you, DM you. Um, hit you up. You're always open to get on a call, talk to people, help them out. Um, you're probably the one of the most giving guys, you know, in real estate. So congrats on that. We need more of you like that. But I literally tell people to hit you up like all the time. And I'm like, you're struggling. I'm like, dude, just call Ricky. I'm like, why? I'm like, I told somebody like, go call other people in other markets that are doing well and get to just, just have a conversation. Like if you're hammering it, like go talk to 10 people that are doing well, that are doing what you're doing. See, tweak it. Don't just sit in there and just keep spinning the wheel. Go talk. That's mastermind. I mean, Ricky's talking to so many people all the time. He talks to so many agents. He can tell you 50 different things where people are doing to have success. So exactly. um, where is the best way if somebody wants to learn more about you, find you, hit you up, what's the best place uh, for them to find you? Yeah, Instagram's really the best place. Um, but go to zero to diamond.com. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm right in the middle of redoing that website. It's going to be way better you know, a better place to get information and connect with me and everything else. So awesome. Well, Ricky, enjoy your holidays. Um, and look forward to see you crush in the new year, your book and everything to come out. And, uh, I'll look forward to staying in touch, brother. Appreciate you, man. All righty. Later, bro. Later, Ricky. See ya.